Hello viewers, I am very pleased to welcome you all to another lecture on beta decay and its energy spectrum. Nuclear physics is a fascinating subject. It is very interesting. A radioactive nucleus loses its energy by giving out some radiations. Such a nucleus is said to be radioactive and this process is called radioactivity or radioactive decay. When a nucleus decay takes place, it could give out alpha particles or beta particles or gamma particles. So a nucleus that gives out alpha radiation is said to have undergone alpha decay. Same is the case with beta decay and gamma decay. Today, let us discuss about beta decay and its energy spectrum. The objective of today's lecture is to facilitate the learners to learn about beta decay in detail along with its energy spectrum. After listening to this lecture, learners will be able to explain beta decay and the change it brings to the atomic number of the nucleus. They will be able to outline the three processes by which beta decay takes place with examples. They will be able to discuss the energy kinematics for beta decay. They describe energy spectrum of beta particles. They will be able to state the difficulties associated with beta ray spectra. Also, they will be able to explain beta decay with the help of neutrino hypothesis. Beta decay. Beta decay is a radioactive process in which an electron is emitted from the radioactive nucleus. You will be surprised to know how come electrons coming out of the nucleus because we know nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons only and how can a nucleus emit electrons from it the answer comes by understanding the following three processes they are electron emission positron emission and electron capture Electron emission. When a radioactive nucleus emits a beta particle, the daughter nucleus has the same mass number, but the atomic number increases by one. The nucleus that gives out radiation, like alpha radiation, beta radiation, is said to be a parent nucleus. So when some change occurs, the newly formed nucleus is called daughter nucleus. So this daughter nucleus will have the same mass number but the atomic number increases by one. This type of decay is called negative beta decay. Negative beta decay is the one in which the daughter nucleus mass number remains the same but the atomic number increases by one. Just look at this example. When a neutron gets converted into a proton, an electron is emitted. Whenever a neutron is converted into a proton, it is accompanied by an emission of electron. So this particle is called beta particle and this is electron. So here we can just see this is atomic number. Or you can say this is the charge of the neutron. So when the neutron gets converted into a proton, its charge becomes one unit. To compensate that, an electron is emitted whose charge is minus one. So plus one, minus one getting zero, that is equal to the charge of the neutron. This refers to the mass number. Neutron has a mass number one, proton has a mass number one, Electron does not belong to the nucleus, so its mass number is zero. One example we'll see here. 
Here we don't know the parent nucleus. The daughter nucleus is sodium and its atomic number is 11 and its mass number is 23 plus one electron. Now we know in negative beta decay, atomic number increases by one. So the daughter nucleus will have atomic number one unit more than that of the parent nucleus. So we can guess that the parent nucleus mass number should be 23 and the atomic number of the parent should be one less than, right? So here we have 11, 11 minus one equal to 10. So if you look into the periodic table and see the element whose atomic number 10 is neon. So easily we can say that the parent nucleus is neon. So you can write neon with atomic number 10 and mass number 23 has become now a daughter nucleus sodium whose atomic number has increased by 1. So 10 plus 1, 11 and mass number remains the same. So such type of decay is called negative beta decay. This is what called electron emission. Next, second process is positron emission. When a radioactive nucleus emits a beta particle, the daughter nucleus has the same mass number, but the atomic number decreases by one. This type of decay is called positive beta decay. So look here, this proton is undergoing conversion. Proton is getting converted into neutron. And a particle whose charge is plus one unit. This is just opposite to the particle electron, which has a negative charge of minus one unit. So we call it as positron. Now look here, proton has a charge 1. So here neutron has a charge 0. But this equation to be satisfied means a particle with charge 1 unit should be emitted. So you say that this particle is a positron. Let us consider one example. We don't know the parent nucleus. The daughter nucleus is sodium and it has atomic number 11, mass number 23, and a positron also has accompanied the daughter nucleus during this process. So as per the definition, the daughter nucleus atomic number should decrease by one unit. So the parent nucleus must have atomic number 12 and mass number should be the same. So mass number is 23, Atomic number 11 plus 1 should be 12. So if you refer to the periodic table, we find the element magnesium whose atomic number is 12. So you can rewrite the equation like this now. Magnesium with atomic number 12, mass number 23, has undergone the nuclear decay or beta decay or positive beta decay giving rise to a daughter nucleus, sodium, with atomic number 11 and mass number 23 with the particle positron. So here, when you compare the daughter nucleus with the parent nucleus, its atomic number has decreased by one. So this kind of emission is called positron emission and this decay is called positive beta decay. Next process is electron capture. So there is another kind of mechanism of transformation in which a proton can be converted into neutron for a radioactive nucleus having high atomic number. What is this mechanism? The proton turns into neutron by absorbing an orbiting electron instead of emitting a positron. In the previous slide, we discussed how a proton could be converted into a neutron. So in the new process called electron capture, proton can be getting converted into a neutron without emitting a positron. How? Here, the proton absorbs 
an electron from outside the nucleus, especially from the K shell, because K shell is very closer to the nucleus. So this mechanism is called as electron capture. A proton inside the nucleus suddenly captures an electron from the K shell outside the nucleus. So this process is called electron capture. The captured electron is pulled into the nucleus. This interacts with the proton inside the nucleus and converts the proton into the neutron. Just have a look at here. The proton inside the nucleus will absorb the electron from the K shell. So this electron gets into the nucleus and interacts with the proton and converts the proton into a neutron. Now, when this electron jumps into the nucleus, a vacancy is created. To fill this vacancy, an electron could jump from L shell to the K shell by giving out its excess energy in the form of K alpha X-ray line. And there is a vacancy here. So, an electron from the higher shells could jump into the L shell, giving out the excess energy in the form of L alpha line. So, the vacancy in the K shell of daughter nucleus resulting from K capture is filled by electron from other shells, which leads to emission of characteristic X-rays of the daughter nucleus. You can see here, X-rays will be emitted from the daughter nucleus. Why this is happening? When the electron jumps into the nucleus, electrons from higher energy shells jumps to fill this vacancy and giving rise to emission of characteristic X-rays. Example, sodium-22 undergoes electron capture according to the following nuclear reaction. So, sodium with atomic number 11 absorbs an electron from the K shell. So, when electron interacts with the proton, minus 1 plus 1 goes. So, the atomic number becomes 10 and the daughter nucleus is not sodium, it is neon. Mass number remains the same, but all the changes occur in the atomic number only. This process will reduce the atomic number of the daughter nucleus by one unit, but the mass number remains the same. Now let us discuss energy kinematics for beta decay. What are beta particles? The electrons and the positrons. So these beta particles with what velocity they are coming out of the nucleus and what energy these beta particles are possessing. That could be discussed now. Let us have a look at this diagram. This is called spectrometer or spectrograph. The radioactive material is coated on a wire and it is kept here. There is a slit. So through the slit, the beta particles which are emitted from this radioactive material will be coming into this section. Here we will be having a powerful magnet. The direction of the magnetic field will be like this, which is perpendicular to the emitted beta particles. So here you can see the spectrograph has four sections. Here source of radioactive material is kept. There is a slit here, the magnetic field region is there. There is another slit which allows the beta particle to travel into this chamber. And here there is an opening. You have a detector or a photographic plate here. So the beta particles, when they enter, experience a force given by Lorentz. This force is equal to BQV. B is the magnetic field in the action. Q is charge of the beta particles. If it is electron, it will have a negative charge. If it is a positron, it will have a positive charge. Now, V is the velocity of the beta particles. Now, when the velocity of the beta particles is perpendicular to the magnetic field, it experiences a centripetal force and describes a circular path. 
Now you can see circle path of three different radii. Very clearly telling beta particles are not emitted from the radioactive source with the same velocity. They have different velocities. So they experience different centipeter force and they describe circular path of varying radii. Now these beta particles due to centipeter force describe a semicircular path and enters into a detector which is a Geiger counter or a photographic plate can be kept here. Now, all these things are arranged in a chamber which is highly evacuated so that air molecules will not disturb the motion of the beta particles. Now, if you keep a photographic film, you can see that the particle which has lesser velocity will describe a lesser radiate path and focus on the photographic film. So, you will get different traces here on the photographic film and instead of photographic film if you have a detector the detector will count how many particles has entered into this chamber now let us see this is the radioactive source material coated on the wire this slit allows beta particles and they enter into the magnetic field which is whose direction is perpendicular to the beta particle. Beta particles travel along semicircular paths and strike a detector situated in the plane of the slit. And there is a lead which will separate the radioactive material from the detector. No beta particle can directly enter into the detector. They have to pass through the magnetic field so that they can experience centipetal force of different magnitude. So this helps us to separate the beta particles which are having different velocities. So when they pass through the magnetic field only, the particles with the different velocities will form different traces on the photographic film. So instead of a photographic film, if you have a Geiger counter, it will tell you how many beta particles have entered into the Geiger counter per second. We know when a beta particle travels in a magnetic field, will experience a force given by F equal to VQV. When the velocity of the beta particle is perpendicular to the magnetic field, it experiences a centipetal force given by MV squared by R. So these two forces should be equal to each other. MV squared by R equal to VQV. Now this V, this V cancels you have mv equal to vqr. The velocity of the beta particle is almost equal to the velocity of light. So we need to apply the relativistic considerations. If m0 be the rest mass of the beta particle and m be the mass and when it is moving with speed v, we can write m equal to m0 by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. This is what the relativistic correction for the mass of the particle. Now you will be wondering what is this rest mass? Rest mass of the particle is the mass measured when the particle is at rest. In this expression, c is the velocity of light. Now you multiply on both sides with velocity v and substitute mv equal to vqr from equation 4, we get m naught v by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared which is equal to vqr. Squaring and adding c squared on both sides of the previous equation and simplifying we could show that 1 by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared is equal to 1 plus vqr by m naught c the whole square of half. We know kinetic energy is equal to total energy minus rest mass energy. From Einstein's expression we know energy is mc squared. 
So kinetic energy becomes total energy is mc squared minus stress mass energy is m naught c squared. The relativistic correction says m equal to m naught by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared into c squared minus m naught c squared is equal to we can write m naught c squared is common you can take it outside now for 1 by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared when you substitute this expression you find that kinetic energy of beta particles coming out of the radioactive nucleus is this much now how to find out this kinetic energy the expression is this this m naught is stress mass of the electron c is the velocity of light V is the magnetic field induction, Q is the charge of the beta particle, R is the radius, right? How to find out the radius? So from this experimental setup, you just measure the distance between the radioactive source and the photographic film. The semicircular part has this much as diameter. So from the diameter, you can find out what is radius and substituting the radius you can find out what is the kinetic energy of the beta particle. Now by replacing this photographic film by a Geiger counter you can count how many particles have entered per unit time into the Geiger counter. By knowing the energy and the number of particles emitted by the radioactive nucleus you can draw a graph. You take energy along x-axis and the number of particles emitted by the radioactive nucleus along y-axis. We will get a graph like this. The continuous line tells that it is continuous spectrum. There are some spikes embedded on the continuous spectrum. This represents the line spectrum. Instead of the Geiger counter, if you have a photographic film, we find a lot of traces on the photographic film. So this dark shade tells that there is a continuous spectrum in which some lines are marked. They represent the line spectrum. The same graph on the photographic film could be seen as a continuous spectrum over which the line spectrum is superimposed. So this is the spectrum, energy spectrum of beta particles. Features of beta ray energy spectra. The beta ray energy spectrum has a continuous spectrum. The continuous spectrum is due to the disintegration in the nucleus. That is continuously a proton is getting converted into neutron or neutron is getting converted into a proton. This depends on the actual decay. The nucleus emit electrons with a continuous range of energies ranging from zero to certain maximum energy. The maximum energy is called endpoint energy and is characteristic of the emitter. What is emitter? The radioactive nucleus. So the endpoint energy tells the characteristics of the nucleus. This point signifies that there is an upper limit to the energy of the beta particle. That means beta particle cannot have infinite energy. It can have maximum energy, but it is finite. Another beautiful point what we observe is that some radioactive nuclei will emit beta particles with single endpoint energy and some nuclei will emit beta particles with two or more endpoint energies. The next feature of the energy spectrum of beta particles is sharp line spectrum. Usually, whenever beta decay takes place, gamma rays also will be emitted along with beta particles. So, a beta decay often accompanied with the emission of gamma ray from the radioactive nucleus. And this gamma ray will have discrete energies only and not infinite energies. These gamma rays knock out electrons from the K shell, L shell, M and N shells and so on. And these electrons are called secondary electrons. 
these electrons form the line spectra the sharp peaks what we observed on the continuous spectrum or line spectra and these line spectrum are formed by these secondary electrons conversion of a neutron into a proton an electron will be coming out so that electron is coming from inside the nucleus but the secondary electrons are extra nuclear not from the nucleus they are coming from the orbital or external electrons so the emission of beta particles may or may not accompanied by emission of gamma rays some examples are that sodium with mass number 24 emit gamma rays why bismuth with mass number 210 does not emit gamma rays so whenever there is no secondary electrons that means whenever there are no gamma rays no secondary electrons then the beta ray spectrum is purely continuous now let us discuss the difficulties what scientists observe with beta ray spectrum the first difficulty is that how come a beta ray spectrum be continuous energy spectrum in shell model we discussed that the nucleons inside the nucleus can exist in different energy levels or the energy of the nucleons is discrete it is a big wonder for scientists how come nucleons give out beta particles with continuous energy that is first question the beta particles may be positron or electron they have spin up so when the beta particles leave the nucleus it should affect the total angular momentum of the nucleus because when the particle is having spin that is a rotation it will have angular momentum so when a positron or electron is leaving the nucleus the spin of the nucleus should be disturbed but what they have found the spin of the nucleus even after emitting the beta particle remained with the same spin or if at all any change occurred integral change in spin was involved so the law of conservation of angular momentum is violated in beta decay this is the second difficulty and the third difficulty is that we can measure actually the linear momentum of the electron and the recoiling nucleus what do you mean by recoiling when the electron comes out of the nucleus the nucleus recoils when we when we just shoot with a gun when the bullet goes out you can see the gun comes little backward that is what called recoil so scientists were able to measure the linear momentum of the electron and the recoiling nucleus and they understood that even principle of conservation of linear momentum is also violated so three main violations in 1930 pauli put forward neutrino hypothesis of beta decay which gave wonderful explanations to all these difficulties which scientists face with beta ray energy spectrum according to pauli's hypothesis whenever beta particles are emitted from the nucleus of a radioactive element they are accompanied with some particles called neutrino these particles have zero mass zero charge and they have spin up during beta decay beta particles are created just at the instant of emission due to the conversion of neutron into proton we know electron is not existing inside the nucleus electron and positron are just created the moment a proton is getting converted into a neutron and vice versa during this conversion an electron and a neutron particles are emitted and can be represented as follows for example when a neutron is getting converted into a proton an electron is emitted we know but according to pauli's hypothesis this 
electron is accompanied with another particle called neutrino. The mass energy balance of beta decay processes shows that neutrino rest mass is negligible. What it means? The neutrino particle cannot be at rest at all like photon. Thus, mass is conserved. What do you mean by for neutron mass number is 1, for proton mass number is 1, and electron mass number is 0, neutrino mass number is 0. So, mass is conserved. The next thing is neutrino particle must have zero charge. Okay, so, you can say neutron charge is 0, proton charge is 1 unit, electron charge is minus 1 unit, plus 1, minus 1, 0. So, left hand side 0, right hand side 0. So, the charge is conserved. The next slide tells that neutrino particle must have a spin half. So, due to the spin, neutrino has definite angular momentum. For a nucleus having odd mass number, the angular momentum is half integral multiplier h by 2 pi. Suppose if the nucleus has even mass number, the angular momentum is integral multiplier of h by 2 pi. We know that angular momentum of the electron, proton and neutron is half h by 2 pi. So if the nucleus has odd mass number, then the angular momentum will be half h by 2 pi. Now, the angular momentum of neutrino, we say it has spin half and its angular momentum is considered to be minus half h by 2 pi. Thus, when a beta particle and a neutrino come out of the nucleus, their angular momentum cancel each other, leaving the angular momentum of the nucleus to remain the same. Instead of electron, if we say the beta particle is positron, once again, the angular momentum is half h by 2 pi. Positron is also accompanied by neutrino. So, the total angular momentum becomes 0. Thus, the angular momentum of the nucleus is unchanged. Let us represent this like this. A neutron is getting converted into a proton. An electron is emitted accompanied with a neutrino particle. So, spin of the neutron is half h by 2 pi. Spin of the proton, half h by 2 pi. Now, spin of the electron is half h by 2 pi. And neutrino is minus half h by 2 pi. So, this and this term combine and making 0. So, left hand side you have half h by 2 pi. Right hand side you have half h by 2 pi. So, the angular momentum due to this spin is unchanged. So, you can see the angular momentum is conserved. But the difficulty what we faced is how a nucleus could emit beta particles with continuous energy like this. So, for this, the explanation is that the energy is shared between the beta particle and the neutrino. The total energy of these two particles is constant because end point energy is constant for a particular element. The energy carried out by the neutrino particle is not fixed. It varies continuously, leaving thereby a continuous varying energy of beta particles. That way, the energy spectrum becomes continuous. When the neutrino gets no energy, then beta particle, the electron or the positron will have the maximum energy. Now, if you consider this region, then the energy carried out by the neutrino and the beta particle will be different. So, at this point, complete energy is carried out by the beta particle. If you consider the lower limit of the continuous spectrum, a greater amount of energy is shared by the neutrino. So, here, neutrino will have more energy, whereas the beta particle will have less energy. The principle of conservation of energy is also satisfied. Thus, neutrino hypothesis of beta decay successfully explains the energy spectrum of beta particles. I hope 
you have enjoyed learning about beta decay and its energy spectrum. Thank you, one and all.